the topic of this video, which should be roughly in the middle of um, the, um, the lectures uh, concerning the 18th century, is, um, is to be understood as a turning point in not only in the 18th century, but really uh, in the larger development of, of literature um, all the way from early modern time to, to, to modernism. So um, it's going to be a little bit more theoretical uh, than um, many of the others um, that, that focus also on texts and, and authors. Um, but I hope to show how um, the shift that I want to emphasize here is, is really a decisive one in, in uh, anyone's understanding of what art is and how art relates to, to life and what the purpose of, of art is. And uh, the main focus um, is going to be uh, aesthetics, um, so the theory of um, of uh, of of art um, and the um, particularly also the effect of art. Now, if you remember a neoclassical criticism, so the criticism that was developed particularly in the first half of the 18th century, uh, attempted to include questions about art into their search for general law. So there was this idea that uh, the ideal uh, and the, the, the perfectly organized cosmos must have uh, clearly understandable laws that, that um, guide everything. So um, critics try to find these laws in, uh, that also would apply for art, um, general laws, general rules uh, to explain what is great art, what is a great, uh, how to create a great piece of, of, of art. Um, and they, they came up with certain uh, aspects um, and those unsurprisingly given their um, predisposition for uh, harmony and order were um, notions like formal perfection, correctness, um, something that adheres to standards, adheres to, to rules, uh, harmony, order and so on. So uh, the idea was that you you're looking for these these elements in, in, a, in, in a work of art and that should explain why this is is great uh, or, or good um, so this is and this is important this is an, an investigation uh, an evaluation of qualities that are objectively inherent in a text or in, a, in an object so something has harmony something has correctness that is part of its being you have this this object this text or or a statue or an, or an image and that has an attribute that is part of this and, and everyone basically needs to see this right so uh, qualities that are objectively inherent in uh, in a text so think of the the work of art as uh, as something and then within that something there is something like for example symmetry uh, but of course, a systematic investigation into art could not ignore the fact that art is not only judged in this way, um, but rather also through the effect that it has on the viewer. So instead of merely the qualities that are objectively inherent in a text, um, there are what we call the affective qualities of an artwork, which is basically how it affects us, how it works on us. Um, so, and this is something that is not objective. This is something that is not contained in the artwork, but that needs an observer to, to actually work. So, whereas the, the earlier one um, looked like this, right, where you merely have um, the work of art, uh, which has a characteristic like symmetry, if we want to understand something like beauty, <clears throat> uh, beauty, um, as, as, as people, of course, observed, is not something that everyone agrees on what is beautiful. So beauty really um, only exists in the mind of the observer. Um, and the observer has it has a certain uh, effect on the observer, um, like like pleasure, for example. So it might be in something in the work of art that works um, to to further pleasure in us. But this this shift from saying all we need to do is look at the piece of art and find out what's in there to recognizing that that's not enough, that we need to take into account the observer and what happens and how far the, the, the work of art actually does something with the observer. That really is the major and fundamental shift that happens um, around the middle of the 18th century and that changes so much in terms of how we understand 
uh, art in general, um, and then of course also literature. And we can trace this effect in, in, in many ways. One of them would be um, the, the, the rise in popularity and importance of this category of, of taste. Now, um, notions of taste had been uh, around quite a, a long time, but um, until that point, taste was basically something that was tied to social class, um, which meant that the higher you are in, 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 in society, the more the more taste you're supposed to have. This is the we still have this idea that that we look up to people who we consider to be um, to have taste and, and and to follow them, and that was basically the court. Um, so the idea was the closer you are to the court, the, the closer you are to this highest notion of of taste. Now that changes. Um, in a sense that taste now becomes um, an innate capability um, of ourselves um, to judge works of art, to, to be uh, open to the effects of, of, of works of art. And, um, and it became a key term in philosophy in, in this way. Um, because now, whereas the uh, earlier, if you wanted to understand and judge and evaluate literature, you had to have those rules, you had to understand um, these uh, these guiding principles, but now you merely had to have taste. Um, this is just uh, one uh, quote of, of the many, many, many quotes about uh, this this topic. Um, All the rules of genuine criticism I have shown, this is a treatise on criticism, I have shown to be ultimately founded on feeling. And taste and feeling are necessary to guide us in the application of these rules to every particular instance. The declamations against criticism commonly proceed upon this supposition that critics are such as judge by rule and not by feeling, which is so far from being true that they who judge after this manner are pedants, not critics. And you, what you see here is this shift away from the rule which is rational, which is something that you can understand with your mind, to something that is much more that's much harder to grasp because it's it's taste it's something that you feel um so you can't describe it as precisely um it's also something that everyone potentially can have but it's also but it's something that is that is not as easily uh, proscribed in in in, in rules and, and another very important consequence of this is this shift in emphasis um towards aesthetic pleasure, away from the, the didactic concepts, because that is a reconceptualization of the nature of literature and art, uh, away from any utilitarian concepts of the didactic in art, art as, as moral instruction, which we, we, we talked a lot about in terms of the, the novel, for example, that was one of the way that the novel legitimized itself, saying, no, 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 this is supposed to make you a better person. Um, and, and what we have here with this shift in, in, in terms of um, what we really should be focused on is what the piece of art does with us. That, and that's an emotional thing that has something to do with pleasure, uh, actually. Um, we have, we're shifting towards this understanding of uh, what Kant would later call disinterested pleasure. So pleasure that is not not for its use, but for itself. Just take, a, a again, um, a more or less random quote um, from, from the time. Uh, when we speak of poetry as an art, we mean such a way or method of treating a subject as is found most pleasing and delightful to us. In all other kinds of literary composition, pleasure is subordinate to use. So um, use is the most important and pleasure is just there to transport the use. In poetry only, pleasure is the end to which use itself must submit. So pleasure becomes the end of poetry, that which it is there for. Um, here, of course, only restricted to poetry. Uh, but once you start that, you, you basically open up yourself to the point which will come a uh, hundred years later to say, actually, all art is about itself. It's a, it is about the aesthetic pleasure. But this is the, the starting point to say, well, maybe it's not merely about what you can learn from it, uh, what what uh, it can teach us, but rather it is there for itself. And that is, of course, um, as I said, a very, very fundamental shift. It is, of course, a shift that is also um, not without its problems, because this revolution means basically that the notion of 
universal laws that guide um, our understanding of art basically had to be abandoned. Um, I, I already said this when, when, when people started to look for these, that this is going to lead to uh, the recognition that that doesn't work. Um, already Alexander Pope in this uh, essay on criticism from, from 1713, uh, so very early in this phase, um, said, it is with our judgment as our watchers, none go just alike, yet each believes his own. So very early critics found out that um, we cannot agree on this. Uh, it, we, can't, we can agree or we have to agree on the law of gravity uh, because we can't say, for me, the apple doesn't fall to the ground. That, that, that doesn't work like that. But I can say, oh, no, I don't like that. You, you think that's great, but I, I, I hate it. Um, so what to do with that, um, right? Um, a writer like uh, Vicesimus Knox uh, wrote, what then it will be asked is criticism to be left forever vague and indeterminate. Is there no standard of taste? So that's something that from the middle of the 18th century, um, writers and critics started to grapple with. Well, if, if taste is subjective, then does that mean that anything goes and that there is no standard and they, they, they desperately try to find um, the standard? The best um, solution that they could basically come up with is encapsulated in this um, second um, um, sentence here uh, that, that follows the first one. I answer that the feelings of the majority of men coinciding for a number of years in the same object constitutes a standard sufficiently certain and uniform. And the writers call this the test of time. Um, with nobody really being able to explain how it how it actually works only they could say yeah but it, it does work um we know that shakespeare is good because we have agreed on the fact that shakespeare is good for um a couple of centuries now so that is pretty uh, that is pretty established um and whether this novel that came out just recently is good we'll have to wait for another 50 years to to find that out but this development of aesthetic series brought with it uh, another revolution. And, and that revolution was the ability to describe and to understand new kinds of aesthetic experiences. So experiences that had always been there, but didn't have a, a theoretical framework to be described and therefore were um, rather invisible in, in, in a way. Um, now, the most obvious effective quality of an artwork is the experience of beauty. Um, we see a piece of art and say, oh, that's beautiful. Um, the question is, what is the opposite of that? So is it um, not beauty? Is it, is it just a lack? Um, is the opposite of beauty just a, 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 an emptiness of uh, a lack of beauty? Is it ugly? Is that is that the opposite um, of beauty? Um, so the the opposite of beauty was was not really describable other than as lacking, um, but it was at the same time it was observable that some things provide aesthetic pleasure and that was after all the important category. Um, some things provide aesthetic pleasure without being beautiful, and people noticed that those were often things that were grand that were frightening um, or vast um, and, um, and they could not be described as, as conventionally beautiful and yet we derived aesthetic pleasure from them. Just compare um, two scenes of nature, if you will. Um, now this, um, this, this, this vista of, of Versailles from 1668 very much follows sort of these, this enlightenment neoclassical idea of nature as being most beautiful where it is most ordered, right? We have Versailles, um, we have nature bound in these symmetrical forms, um, but there is also nature around this, but it, it, it is very much an, an, an exemplification of nature as, as ordered cosmos. And we can say this is beautiful um, or boring, depending on, um, on, on where we stand. But compare it to this one here, to, um, Philly James de Luterburg's An Avalanche, which is anything but symmetrical, anything but conventionally beautiful. It's a terrible subject. It's, it's terrifying. It's unordered, unruly. Um, you have people who are afraid, um, who, who are, so you can see it in, in, their, in their body language that this is terrible. And yet it's grand. It's, um, 
um, it's it's something but it's not beautiful so what then is this and, and the category that was developed um, by um, writers in the 18th century to describe this kind of experience was the sublime uh, in aesthetics the sublime um, from the latin sublimis is the quality of greatness whether physical moral intellectual metaphysical aesthetic spiritual or artistic anything that is great vast frightening and the development of the concept of um, the sublime as an aesthetic quality in nature um, that was distinct from beauty uh, was first brought into prominence uh, by the writings of um, some English uh, men um, starting with Anthony Ashley Cooper the third Earl of ja uh, Shaftesbury um, then the critic uh, John Dennis uh, and later Joseph Addison whom we have met as the writer of um, the moral weeklies and all of these three Englishmen had within the space of a, of a few years made the journey across the Alps now um, as you might be aware part of the um, genteel education of an Englishman was a so-called grand tour so um, if you went on the grand tour that basically meant you went to France in order to experience the courts of today the, the grandest I remember this idea that that um, taste is is um, associated with the court so um, there was no court at the time that was more splendid and more glorious than the French um, court so you had to go there um, and you went to Italy to study um, antiquity because that was the uh, you couldn't go to, to Greece that was too much of a, of a hassle to get there uh, but you go could go to Rome um, and, and study the Roman uh, antiquities and, and, and think about um, antiquity but to get there to get to Italy you had to cross the Alps and for, for uh, a long time that has basically had been just a hassle on the way to get to Italy as was this terrible place um, hard to get through uh, nothing to see there uh, everything is sort of uh, just a, just a hindrance and now we have these three people who at the same time do this uh, journey that so many others had done and they stop there and they say well you know this is kind of something um, it's not beautiful but it does fill me with aesthetic pleasure Edison writes the Alps fill the mind with an agreeable kind of horror so what is that right it's it's not beautiful it's hor it's actually horrible um, but it's an agreeable kind of of horror so that was the starting point to notice there is something um, but it was really um, Edmund Burke with his philosophical inquiry into the origin of our ideas of the sub sublime and the beautiful in 1756 who, who theorized the whole concept and to, who tried to do an in, a systematic investigation of well, what is the difference between the, the beautiful and the sublime and where does the sublime come from, how does it work and what kind of an ex uh, aesthetic experience is it. Of course I can't get into all of the details here um, just a few facts one of the things that, that that Burke made clear right from the beginning is that the sublime and the beautiful um, are um, mutually exclusive something that is uh, to the extent that something is beautiful it cannot be sublime and the other way around so they're, they're, they're very distinct things um, and then he looked at the causes of, of the sublime and he wrote that whatever is fitted in any sort to excite the ideas of pain and danger that is to say whatever is in any sort terrible or is conversant about terrible terrible objects or operates in a manner analogous to terror is a source of the sublime that is it is productive of the strongest emotion which the mind is capable of feeling Burke actually also claimed the sublime is actually works even stronger on us than um, than than beauty <clears throat> now of course this is just a description of negative feelings uh, terror so why haven't we noticed that 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 before um, would everyone was aware of course of, of fright and, and terror but the fundamental change um, here comes later because it is the discovery that distance can turn the experience around something can turn something that is terrible into something that is sublime as he writes when danger or pain press too nearly they are incapable of giving any delight and are simply terrible but at certain distances and with certain modifications they may be and they are delightful as we everyday experience 
just compare the the actual experience of falling off a cliff to that of standing on the edge of a cliff looking down that is frightening but you're not dying and and people do that because it gives them an aesthetic pleasure that is tied to the experience of of, of fear or think of the difference between encountering a tiger alone uh, in the wild to seeing one in a zoo or seeing one um, from from a, a safari car a again we have uh, something that we're supposed to be afraid of and that becomes uh, a, a, an enjoyable experience because of the distance uh, that we have but of course um, the thing that 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 is most capable um, of creating such a distance experience of something that is terrible is art so to sum this up the sublime gave a theoretical category to phenomena and to effects that were not describable before in neoclassical theory and it therefore made it possible to consider both in nature and in art objects that were deemed unfit before it gave rise to a whole new range of aesthetic experience um, exemplified in the rising interest in mountains and it made possible the emergence of new modes of writing um, that that fundamentally rely on the effect that it produces in us and um, the next two videos will will be concerned with these new modes that arise at this point of time but not by chance but because they are fueled by this shift um, towards the effective qualities of art and these two modes of writing are of course the gothic and the sentimental